Thank you, Pierre, for your introduction. And uh, Professor Kellens, thank you for your invitation. I apologize. I will have to speak English to you today. I apologize also that I've not had an opportunity to translate my PowerPoint, so it will be in English also. Hopefully you will bear with me through this. I also want to thank uh, Celine for all of her efforts in getting me here. Uh, it was very much appreciated. What I want to do today in the 30 minutes that I have is to explore some aspects of the evidence for the depiction of the divine and the numinous in the glyptic from two important archives from Persepolis. These are known as the Persepolis Fortification Archive, dated to the middle years of the reign of Darius, and the Persepolis Treasury Archive, dated uh, a little bit after that period. And then to say a few words about the implications of this evidence for our conceptualization of the, what we can call the religious landscape in Fars in the range, particularly of Darius the, uh, Darius the I. Now before I get to that, first a few questions that I have, or not necessarily questions, but problems that I encounter as someone who deals primarily with this topic on the level of an art historian coming at it through visual evidence. As a student, we learn very early on that this figure that we see at Bissitun, the so-called winged symbol, is the most controversial aspect of Achaemenid iconography. And as a student, you learn that there are various explanations that have been offered for it. I'm not going to explore those because I think that Bruno Jacobs will talk a little bit more about this in his paper. So you learn that there are these various explanations for it. And I think, or at least for me, it's only a little bit later that you come to realize that all of these explanations are in fact based upon the same premise. Because the Achaemenids were Zoroastrian, that leads to the inference that any major deity, such as the winged symbol, represented in art, must be Ahura Mazda, because Ahura Mazda is the supreme deity as witnessed by the Achaemenid imperial inscriptions. At the same time, because the Achaemenids were Zoroastrian, no major deity represented in art can be Ahura Mazda, since Zoroastrianism does not allow for the depiction of the supreme deity. Now, from a mythological perspective, this is an unhealthy place to be, where that everyone has the same premise applied to the same data, but you get polar opposite results. It's not my job today to try to work through that, but I think we will all be kind of trying to handle this a little bit. And of course, we're involved in this complicated mixture of the Achaemenid material record, the Greco-Roman tradition, particularly Herodotus, and the Avestan tradition. Again, this is not exactly my mission here today to discuss that. As I say, these are questions, problems that one encounters from the visual perspective. Another issue that I think uh, perhaps could use some discussion is the fact that traditionally in approaching this topic of Achaemenid religion, we see the Achaemenids as this massive rupture, disrupture, disjointedness from the traditional Assyro-Babylonian culture. And so that when we look for explanations, and I'm not talking about specific explanations of specific aspects of iconography, say, between Bissitun and Nanxi Rustam, we don't look traditionally to the Assyrian evidence, but we look to the Eastern evidence to attempt to explain some of these issues. Now, this uh, perspective of relying, sort of approaching the subject from an Eastern perspective rather than what we could call a Western perspective, perhaps may be one reason why seals have traditionally not figured very prominently in the discussion of Achaemenid religion. Seals are hugely important in the traditional Assyro-Babylonian context. Now, these are just two examples of unprovenance Achaemenid seals. We today are going to be dealing with some much more interesting evidence, seals that are preserved, applied on clay administrative documents from Persepolis. And in a traditional Assyro-Babylonian context, 
we rely very heavily on Glyptic because very often the data set for visual imagery that we have in Glyptic does not match that which we have in monumental art. And the example that I gave in my pre-conference uh, paper, perhaps the most famous example is uh, Akkadian art. Everyone has agreed that one of the great high points of the art of, the, of ancient Western Asia is the Akkadian period. Were we to have only Akkadian monumental sculpture, we could in fact say very little about the nature of the divine and the numinous. However, the glyptic evidence opens a window that is completely, I say completely unexpected, looking just at the monumental evidence because, the, uh, because Akkadian glyptic preserves for us these magnificent scenes, narratives, all kinds of different deities, specifically identified by specific type of iconography, so that this data set does not match this data set for this particular issue. And I think it is much the same for the Achaemenid material. So now let me turn to these two archives and look very quickly in the time that I have with, um, at, um, at what, we've, what we've got. These two archives are well known. This is, of course, an aerial view of Persepolis. The two archives are known as the Fortification and the Treasury Archive. The Fortification Archive found in two chambers up here on the Fortification Wall. The Treasury Archive found in rooms of the, uh, rooms of the Treasury. Now, the Treasury Archive is well known, published in the 1950s by Schmidt in these lavish folio formats by the Oriental Institute. 77 seals were preserved on clay documents. That is, the impression of 77 different seals were preserved on the clay documents from the Treasury Archive. Now, the Fortification Archive is still, the glyptic from the Fortification Archive is still in the process of study. And this is not a mistake. Currently, we have identified three over 3,100 different seals that occur in the archive from the fortification. 3,100. This is an unprecedented density of visual imagery at a particular time and at a particular space that there's almost no parallel for, certainly in ancient Western Asia. I'll be talking primarily about the glyptic from the fortification archive because this material is less, less well known. However, I will uh, also be talking a little bit about some of the material from the treasury archive. Now, the thing that's, there's lots of things that distinguish the glyptic from the fortification archive, but really it is its archival context that so enriches this visual imagery. That is, this visual imagery does not just float in time and space but is locked, literally locked onto these tablets that carry administrative texts. This evidence comes from a very particular time, the reign of Darius I, the fortification archive in particular, the treasury archive a little bit later, and the evidence comes from one particular place, Persepolis. So we have the great advantage of dealing with evidence that has a known and excavated provenance evidence that is restricted in both time and space. And perhaps even more importantly, this is evidence that comes from the most critical period in the formation, the establishment of the protocols, both uh, at court and for the things that I'm interested in, the visual protocols in what we today designate as the Achaemenid Persian Empire. So the coincidence of time, space, and number of images is remarkable. And this is the thing that makes this archive so interesting. Now, as I mentioned to you, uh, Professor Jacobs will be telling you more about the winged symbol. I talk a little bit about it in my paper, and I'm not going to say much about it here today. This type of scene on seal number 11, PFS 11 from the archive, is a scene that we would recognize immediately as an Achaemenid scene. I mean, this, this just has everything that we would traditionally associate. That is the winged symbol, the dentate crown, the Persian court robe worn by the uh, royal figures, the palm tree, the trilingual royal inscription. We preserve at Persepolis, within Persepolis Glyptic, I think 
a period of experimentation in what I call court-centric iconography. And that is iconography that is sort of being built around the idea of the king. And so we have seals such as seal number 91 here, which looks Achaemenid, but it is not something that we recognize right off traditionally as an Achaemenid object. So here's the figure, the winged symbol, handing a ring to a figure in at least half, who's wearing half of the so-called Persian court robe. One thing that I think is perhaps potentially interesting is that in these kind of experimental phases of what we could call court-centric glyptic, the winged symbol has a more active role. The, it, it actually is engaging with the, uh, with the attendants. Whereas when we get these court style, what I call court style things, there's this distance between the two. I think that that may potentially be an interesting and important uh, thing. Here's another seal. Uh, these are two impressions of it. I don't have a drawing, but I think you can make out this very kind of unusual looking figure in the winged disc, this massive ring that he is handing out. Of course, the handing of the ring is a traditional theme in Assyro-Babylonian, indeed, earlier periods as well. And here's the attendant. You, you, you miss him over here, who's reaching for it. There's a star, a crescent, and then underneath it, there is something that looks like a wheel, but in fact, this is a stylized tree. And here again, this particular seal, uh, as almost all of these, lead us into a very interesting series of connections with Assyrian and Babylonian glyptic because here are two examples of Assyrian seals where you very often get paired the winged symbol above the stylized tree. So winged symbol, stylized tree. This is just a really abstracted version, although we do get, do get this type of thing in Assyrian glyptic. In Persepolitan glyptic, we also get this very common combination of the bull men who are holding aloft the winged symbol above the stylized stylized tree. So you almost always, with this material that deals with the divine and the numinous, you slip very easily into this, what I would call an Assyro-Babylonian idiom, for lack of a better way of thinking about it. Now we have lots of ways of depicting the divine in traditional sort of Assyro-Babylonian parlance, and I'm just going to show you a few examples here in the time that I have today. For instance, what we call a figure in a nimbus. A nimbus is a circle, sometimes having stars or rays, that outlines part of the body. And this is the traditional way in Assyro-Babylonian glyptic in earlier periods as well of indicating a divine personage. Here's a seal 68, uh, rendered in this very interesting Persepolitan modeled style, which itself is very archaizing. Now we have another kind of version of that that I want to show you on this now, I think, fairly well-known seal, seal 38, which belongs to uh, Irtash Duna, one of the wives of Darius. And here you see a different sort of aspect of that knit figure within a nimbus. And here again is in a drilled style Akkadian, uh, sorry, Assyrian seal, where the goddess Ishtar very often is depicted in this nimbus that has stars coming off of it. Now, I don't have time to go into the... Uh, detailed analysis of this seal 38, but you can see that it is loaded, in fact, with divine imagery. And that divine imagery, again, is heavily Assyrianizing. Now, whether or not this is, an, say, an heirloom, an actual Assyrian seal, I don't think so, but many people have suggested to me that it, is, in fact, is an Assyrian product, or whether it's what I would call Assyrianizing, it doesn't really matter at this point. This seal is being used by one of the highest ranking people at Persepolis, one of the wives of Darius. And so this imagery is not selected simply at random. This is something that is purposeful. Another way of traditional way of depicting the divine and the numinous is uh, a figure within a crescent or a circle. Uh, the ones at Persepolis we have tend to show a partial either a partial crescent or almost a full one here. Here are two examples. This uh, imagery is seen sometime, uh, in three seals in the treasury archive where the circle actually goes all the way around the figure. So it actually is a half figure within a circle, but the lower part of that circle is thickened, like we see here, in the form of a crescent. Now we may have to do with two separate entities here, 
But the important point is that, again, this is a very traditional Assyro-Babylonian uh, uh, way of depicting the divine. And note again the use of the bull man as an atlas figure uh, that indicates you're sort of within this divine or numinous space. The logical assumption is that we have to do here with a lunar deity. Now, I want to show you a couple of seals that are so remarkable in the kind of concentration of court-centric imagery in the case of uh, seal 261, but also loaded up with divine reference. This is a seal that shows a partial figure elaborately decked out in the Persian court robe who is an archer figure rising up or on the back of this composite winged bird, scorpion-tailed, bull-headed creature. Now, this creature appears to be sort of floating in space. It is very similar to yet another kind of crazy winged floating creature that we get, that we have an example of at Persepolis. This time it's a lion, human, winged creature, archer emerging out of a long neck goose or bird. Now this thing, if you had seen this seal on the art market, you would say it's a forgery because it is such a, a strange looking thing. Here are just some examples of it actually applied to the, to the tablet. Now, there are lots of interesting things that these two seals raise for us, but I think for our perspective here today, what they do is they provide, they enlarge the context now for thinking about this figure. So often we have thought about this figure only exclusively kind of within, well, how did it get out of Assyrian and Babylonian imagery and is adopted within this new Achaemenid context, which is in fact a rupture with the past. But now these seals and others that I'm going to show you, we've got this whole world at Persepolis of creatures that have partial human bodies that float. So that the winged symbol now no longer is simply this kind of isolated thing that we have to sort of try to make up a context for it. We've got a divine context for it now. And as so often, we can make a series, there are a series of linkages with this imagery where we see similar types of things. So uh, this particular example here, a bull-headed, winged human torso. He's actually, again, an archer. It's interesting, of course, about the importance of, of the bow and the arrow to Darius and his official imagery, the archer series of coins. Um, anyway, that's a different talk. Uh, a fish creature this time. These are related to a remarkable series of composite human winged creatures. This one, again, an archer, partial human figure, winged, a bird, but it has an animal foreleg. More often, these archer creatures, in fact, are grounded. They have animal legs, sometimes multiple animal legs. And this is a, these are a remarkable sequence of archer seals. Sometimes they involve scorpion elements, winged scorpion men, such as you see here, or a different version, a bird scorpion creature that has a partial human, uh, human torso. Now, in, in addition to these kind of various composite human animal entities that we have in Persepolitan Glyptic, we also have more traditional Assyro Babylonian uh, uh, creatures. The bull man is a very common one. So the bull man has a human head, the torso and arms of a human, but then a tarine or bull lower body. Very often at Persepolis, they are again in this atlas pose. We've seen them in a couple of examples now. This seal, and again, an important one because it belongs to the deputy director of the archive. This is a particularly interesting one here because this creature is enclosed in this, uh, in this frame. And this, again, is a traditional way of indicating divine, religiously charged space in Assyrian, um, in Assyrian glyptic, rendered a little bit differently here, of course. Closely related are the human-headed bull, right? So that these are creatures that have uh, only the human head, not a human arms. They tend to be stand upright, a royal name seal here, or a human-faced uh, creature. This one has a scorpion tail. These types of creatures are 
intimately linked to court-centric iconography and so I think deserve a special study in and of themselves. So two traditional Assyro-Babylonian creatures such as the human-headed scorpion creature that you see in these two examples, this belonging to one of the regional office seals at Persepolis. Fishman, yet uh, another Assyro-Babylonian phenomenon that is revived in uh, Persepolitan glyptic. They tend to occur as what we call, what I call pedestal creatures, that is creatures that support a worshiper or a t an attendant. And note again the, the particular syntax that we get repeated over and over. Winged symbol, stylized tree, pedestal creatures, and attendants to either side. Uh, the dentate crown here, dentate crown here, signals that you're in the Achaemenid context. Although this again looks very Assyrian, the dentate crown certainly locates us in time uh, as, a, as an Achaemenid one. And then this is just again a remarkable image. It almost seems as if it walks off, has walked off of a relief at Persepolis where you get this kind of syntax of winged symbol, inscription, and then attendance on either side, but it charged in a, in a very, very different uh, way. The most common creature, that is this kind of composite human creature, human and animal creature that we get at Persepolis, is the, uh, is the human-headed lion. Literally hundreds, hundreds of examples of this that occur in all kinds of different contexts. Here are just two examples that you see here. Now, of course, the traditional way of depicting the divine and the numinous in the Assyro-Babylonian tradition is simply by animals or by winged creatures. Certainly the winged lion represents this is a fantastical thing. And we have, again, hundreds of these. Now, since we do not have the types of literature that we have from the Assyro-Babylonian context, that is ritual text, omen text, these types of things that often inform us about the nature of these deities, or of these creatures, they're often kind of apotropaic in a, a syro babylonian context. It's hard to know what to make of it when you just have these heraldic ones here. But in some cases, it is clear that we are in some kind of divine context because you have a worshiper that stands before it, or this remarkable seal, beautifully carved in this Persepolitan model style, which combines this winged lion creature with the spade of Marduk and the stylus of, of Nabu. Just a remarkable reworking of that kind of tradition. The most common way that the divine is indicated in Persepolitan glyptic is in abstract symbols. And here I'm thinking particularly about the star and the crescent. They occur everywhere in Persepolitan glyptic. Again, these are, are, are uh, traditional ways of depicting the divine in an Assyro-Babylonian context. And so, too, we have this scene, which uh, has traditionally, or is traditionally now called the Neo-Babylonian or the Late Babylonian worship scene, where a worshiper stands before uh, the spade of Marduk and the, uh, the double stylus, styli of, uh, of Nabu. Now, of course, already in the 1970s, Richard Zettler recognized that this scene type goes well down into the 5th century in the Achaemenid uh, uh, period. I think we probably have the largest collection of this late Babylonian worship scene of any place in Assyria, Babylonia. In other words, the number we have of them outnumber any from any other context. And so, too, we have the combination of the worshiper standing before, uh, in this case, uh, a bull creature with the lightning bolt of, uh, of, of Adad, or in this case, what appears to be a kurduru with a crescent on top of it and a worshiper, a worshiper before it. In fact, we have the whole range of imagery that you often get in these so-called late Babylonian worship uh, scenes. Now, these scenes, of course, raise an interesting question. And that is, they appear to locate us in a particularly charged ritual space. That is, that you have a worshiper who is standing before emblems of the divine, seemingly, potentially, in some kind of realistic space. Now, the text from Persepolis, the Elamite text, which Walter Hinkerman has so eloquently articulated, showing this wide range of deities that is worshipped in, uh, in the region of Persepolis, whose worship cult is supported by the state, they do not mention these traditional Babylonian deities. But the very existence 
of all of these deities in the uh, text from the Fortification Archive, a priori, I think, make us assume that there are, in fact, other deities out there who are not captured in these ration lists. Now, they very well may be Marduk and Nabu and some of the ones. We don't know that, of course, but it opens the door for the potential for the existence of the worship of these deities. I want to close with some scenes that Lokahitas, perhaps in a context that's a little more knowable from a traditional Achaemenid perspective. And I will end with, uh, uh, I'll end with these. We have a remarkable series of scenes that show an attendant at a stepped platform on which there is a burning fire. This is the impression of this seal. Now, there is a much literature on the issue of fire worship and fire temples in, in the Achaemenid uh, period, and I don't have time to go into all of that. In these scenes that we get, the attendant is always doing something at the, at the fire uh, and almost always has a cup or a pitcher that is pouring some kind of liquid libation into it. There's a variation of this scene. Here's the stepped structure with the fire, not well preserved. This time, butchery associated with it. In all of these scenes that involve this step structure with a fire, we do not seem to be within a context of the worship of sacred fire, but rather fire as a traditional medium of converting offerings that you give to the divine. In this case, we see the actual butchery of the animal, which we assume is going to be put into the, the fire. Now, this leads us to these other structures that have very often been identified as fire altars or fire temples. This one uh, is a tower-like structure. I call it the tower structure, and it has this battlement profile. There are a few scenes of it, like we've seen here in this important seal, uh, number 11. Again, these, this is a scene that we would recognize as a Achaemenid right away. Right? In other contexts, we get this tower-like structure. Rather than having that kind of battlement, it has this V-shape. But note the recessed paneling. This seems to be sort of a, something that is, that is common to all of these scenes. We have a lot of them that show a seated figure with an animal before this structure. Sometimes uh, the seated figure holds drinking vessels, as if we're in some kind of banquet type of, uh, of setting. Sometimes there are processions towards this tower structure. In this case, again, getting ready to slit the throat, an attendant getting ready to slit the throat of an animal. Or this scene, which I don't have time to go into, it's just a, a remarkable, it in, in fact, it appears to be a procession towards this tower structure um, that it seems to me to be an offering scene. That is, they're bringing offerings to this particular space. Now, the most remarkable sequence that we get in this group that show these two structures are about 13 seals now that pair the two structures together. That is, the tower structure here, I'm uh, sorry, the step structure with burning fire and the tower structure here. All of these scenes are processional. So in one type, an attendant leads an animal, and the other attendant is offering up a liquid libation. So you have liquid libation and the preparation for animal sacrifice. In this one, they're actually cutting the throat of the animal. I mean, remarkably vivid, these scenes of animal sacrifice that we get in the context of these two structures. The other variant we have on this scene is not animals, but a procession of figures who carry vessels. There are two types, this handleless type, and this one with these three elaborate ones. You can just see a handle, or a, uh, one of these vessels here. And the attendants always put their hands up to their mouths. Now again, this leads us into a really interesting discussion about this gesture within uh, Achaemenid art, which I don't have a chance to go into right, uh, uh, right now. So let me try to bring a synopsis here and close. In working with the glyptic from the Fortification Archive, one of the things that just strikes you right away is how saturated, how just thoroughly saturated it is with the image of the divine and the numinous, and how varied the presentation is. As I stressed, this imagery is deeply, deeply embedded in an Assyro-Babylonian tradition I haven't had time to go into the Elamite because I think my colleague Walter Hinkelman will talk a little bit more about that in his paper a little bit later today. 
So the picture that emerges from the glyptic from the fortification archive concerning the divine and the numinous is a varied picture. It's diverse and it is very rich. That diversity, I think, remarkably works as almost a mirror to the text, the Elamite text from the fortification archive, where you have this rich landscape with multiple deities that are, that are worshipped. Now, this evidence that I've presented for you here today by no means excludes the idea that some of it may involve some aspect of Mazda worship in some kind of form. But to try to take all of this evidence and say all of it is Mazda worship, I think, would be, uh, or specifically Zoroastrianism, is a very difficult thing to do. So too would it be difficult to explain all of this evidence away as simply meaningless road perpetuation of older traditions of representing the divine and the, and the numinous. Thank you for your attention.